Well, hey, everybody. My name is Kent. I'm lead pastor here at Epic, and I'm so glad you're at church today. In fact, everybody here at Parkside, do me a favor and help me welcome everybody who's watching from our other locations this morning, yeah? <laughs> What's up, everybody? Fairmount, Center City, Roxboro, love you guys. Glad you're at church today. Uh, it's a good, good day. Uh, it's a good day for a bunch of reasons. One, it's a good day because it's Epic Day. Uh, now, nobody really knows exactly what that means, but hey, it's fun. We got a t-shirt. We're good, right? Everybody's happy. It's all right. It's okay. So that makes it a good day. Uh, it's also a good day because now, even though it's a little rainy outside, it's, it's, not, it's not so cold that the wind hurts your face, right? So I don't know about you, but like a couple weeks ago, I walked outside and I was like, why is the air mad? Like, what did we do to make the air mad? Why is it angry? What happened, right? So that's not going on today. So that makes it a good day. It's a good day. Also a good day because the Eagles aren't going to the Super Bowl. Come on. People lost their minds after last week's game. I was watching the news. I was watching Fox, and I was watching, also following along on social media. And uh, I kept seeing church people running around the streets of Philadelphia Losing their minds. I was like, seriously? That's church people. One of which was our location pastor from our center city location, Will, <laughs> standing on top of a trash can, losing. Ah! I was like, oh my gosh, he's on staff. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, real quick. I, I wanted to do this real quick. Hey, are there any Cowboys fans here? Ah! <laughs> 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 <sighs> That's it. I just wanted to get that off my chest. <laughs> Today is a good day. Now, on top of all that, we're starting this brand new series called Relation Shifts. And it's a series that's all about how we relate to and how we treat other people, even how we relate to and treat Cowboys fans. So obviously, I have a lot to learn from this series. In fact, I think that's true. I really do have a lot to learn from this series. In fact, I think... We all do. And the truth is that no man is an island. Like, we've all got relationships. And so that's why I think this series is going to be so relevant. That's why I think this series is going to be so helpful for all of us. And what I think is going to be most surprising, or what you're going to find most surprising, is how much God really cares about all those relationships. It's way more than you would think. And I think it's going to be surprising how much we discover that God wants to be part of helping us navigate the complexities of all those different relationships. Because sometimes it is complex, right? And people are messy. Heck, we're messy. It's true. And so it can be hard to forgive and hard to accept and hard to love and hard to serve. The good news is that the Bible is full of practical wisdom and advice about how to do all those things. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to kind of do a deep dive into this topic. We're going to learn a ton of helpful stuff. But today, today's just an introduction. And really my goal is just to answer the question, why? And so before we jump into all that, let's take a moment just to pray, and then we'll go right at it. Let's do that. God, thanks so much that uh, you're here to meet with us today. And Lord, I pray that you'd give us the wisdom to know what to do with what we're about to hear and the courage to do it. I pray that every single one of us would leave our locations today challenged and encouraged. In Jesus' name, amen. You know who I hate? That's a weird thing to say after you just prayed. Let me say it this way. You know how I find it really, really hard to like? People who hurt or mistreat one of my kids. And if you're a parent, you're like, like you totally get that, right? Because inside every parent is this mama or papa bear that just can't wait for the moment that someone messes with one of our cubs. It's our natural instinct, right? We don't even think about it. Like you hurt one of our kids, we're going to eat you. Like, it's going to happen, right? We don't even think about it. And, and here's the thing about that. There's no point in trying to play nice with me after you've hurt one of my kids. I mean, you could buy me gifts. You could give me money. You could sing me songs. You could praise my holy name. But there's nothing that someone can do to fix it 
after they've hurt one of my kids. Like, I'm coming for you. I'm just saying. It's, I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying it's true. I don't like you, and me and you got problems, right? Now, the opposite is also true. The best thing that someone can do for me is do something for one of my kids. Like, the best, most honoring thing that someone can do for me has nothing to do with me. The best thing that someone can do is love on or care for one of my kids. In fact, a few months ago, uh, this is Tessa, Tessa Smucker. She leads worship over at our Fairmount location. Uh, A few months ago, she took my daughter Kaylee, who turned 10 yesterday, by the way, just saying, double digits. She's a decade old. It's awesome. (laughs) And a little sad. I'm like, stop growing up. Anyways, so Tessa took my daughter Kaylee out on on a girl's day. Uh, And they they spent the day shopping, going for ice cream, singing in the car at the top of their lungs to a bunch of Justin Timberlake songs, which, let's face it, that's a good day for everybody. (laughs) And this was huge for Kaylee. It was huge for her because because the best way I can describe it is Tessa to Kaylee. Tessa is like her spirit animal. Like if, if Kaylee could be anything or anybody, she would want to be Tessa. And so now every time I see Tess, I think about that. Like every time I see her, I think about what she did for my kid. And sometimes I thank her all over again. Tessa, thank you so much. She's like, for what? That thing you did three months ago. It was amazing. Thank you so much for the way that you treated my daughter. And truth be told, there's, there's not much that I wouldn't go out of my way to do for Tessa because of how she's treated my little girl. When you treat my children well, you're treating me well. And when you treat my kids poorly... You're treating me poorly. And I've just got this hunch that God, the one who invites us to relate to him as our heavenly father, is the same way. He just really loves his kids. And how we treat them and how we treat each other really matters to him. Over and over again, we see this in the scripture. Jesus taught this again and again. In fact, in one of his most famous sermons called the Sermon on the Mount, which was a sermon that he taught from the side of a mountain. They weren't real creative with titles back then. In fact, nobody was sitting around going, we should call this relationships. Let's do that, right? Nobody was thinking that, right? So, so, so Jesus taught this sermon on the side of a mountain. And, um, and in this sermon, he, he, he talks about this thing that we're, we're, we're bringing up today. Here's what he says in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 23. He says this. He says, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and so he says, hey, if you're at church or if you're at the temple, which is where people went to go and worship God, if you're at church and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Now, notice what he says. You remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Like, not even you remember that you have something against somebody else, but Just in case you think someone might have something against you, what do you do? Here's what he says. He says, leave your gift there in front of the altar. And first, go be reconciled to that person. And then come and offer your gift. Now, that's so counterintuitive, isn't it? Like if you were in the middle of a church service and you're trying to make a connection to God, you would think you finish that up first. And if you happen to think of something, you know, you got an issue with somebody else. Then you go talk to them afterwards, like if you really, really, really want to, like trying to get bonus points or extra credit or something like that. Like then you go work it out. But Jesus says here, he says, no, 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 no. Don't think that it's all good with you and God if you've got something between you and somebody else. You've got to go to that person first and get that straightened out. And all of a sudden here in this passage, we're introduced to this idea that there's some kind of a connection between our vertical relationship with God and the horizontal relationships that we have with other people. Now, so many times we try to separate those two things. But Jesus says, no, no, there's absolutely a connection. Like if you're, if you're coming to God, but there's something between you and another person, here's what he's saying in this passage. Stop where you are. God can wait. Like, go find that other person and make things right. That's how important your relationships with others are to me. Now, another time, uh, there's a group of people who come to Jesus, and they ask him this question. They say, what's the greatest commandment that there is? Like, what's the most important one? Look what he says in Matthew 22, verse 37. He says this. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, which 
which is what they would expect him to say, except he doesn't stop talking. Like, he keeps it going. And before they could jump in and ask anything else or, or bring anything else up, here's what he says, verse 39. He says, and the second is like it, to which they thought to themselves, hold on, we didn't ask for a second. Like, what do you mean uh, the second is like it? And Jesus says, yeah, I know, but I can't just give you just one. I have to give you two because the second one is just like it. And in other words, he was saying the second one is just as important. And then that's when Jesus says to love your neighbor as yourself. Huh. He, he says these two things, you're loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. He says these two things are so connected they're so a part of each other that I can't just tell you one of them. Because oftentimes, here's the deal, we don't realize that there is a connection between our vertical relationship with God and our horizontal relationships with other people. Now, if you think about it, that's a little disturbing, isn't it? I mean, come on. Uh, it'd be nice to think that those, things, those two things are mutually exclusive, that they can live in two different worlds. I would like to just have my relationship with God and then my relationship with other people. They just kind of, those two should never meet. Let's, let's leave those things alone, right? It, it'd be nice to think that the most important thing to God is that I love him with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind, and that's it. And I'm okay with that if that would be the case, right? And here's why. It's because nobody knows how I'm doing with that. Like, you can't see my heart and my mind and my soul. So you have no clue. But then you throw in this love your neighbor as yourself mumbo jumbo. Now I got problems. And here's the reason why. It's because my neighbor knows. You know what I'm saying? Like, your neighbor knows if you're really loving them as you love yourself. Like, my spouse, your spouse knows if you're loving them as you love yourself. Your friends know. Your girlfriend, she knows, and all her friends know, because she told them, all of them, <laughs> multiple times. And your, free, your, your girlfriend's mama knows, and your girlfriend's mama's sister knows, because the mama told her sister. That's just how it works. Everybody knows whether you're loving them as you love yourself. Trust me. Your coworkers know if you're loving them as you love yourself. Other people know if you're loving them as you love yourself. And, and think about what he said for a moment. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Huh. Think about how much you love yourself. I don't know about you, but I love me some me. <laughs> I do. I do. I love me some me. I feed me. I take care of me. I look out for me. I give me all kinds of chances, second chance, third chance, 40th chance. I'm patient with me, I'm understanding with me, I'm gracious with me, I'm considerate of me. I almost always give me the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> and so Jesus says, hey, you should probably love other people like that too. And we're like, nah. <laughs> it's like Jesus is saying, no, 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 you don't understand. It's just as important that you love others this way as you love yourself, as it is that you love God with all your heart and soul and mind. In fact, you can't fully love God with all your heart, soul, and mind if you aren't loving others as yourself. See, we don't always see it. We don't always realize it. But there's absolutely a connection between our vertical relationship with God and our horizontal relationships with other people. And then in John chapter 13... Like just before Jesus leaves the earth, he, he met with his closest followers. And I want you to look at what he said to them, starting in verse 34. He said this, a new command I give you. Now, this was huge. This was a really big deal. Only God had the power to give a command, all right? Like this is, this is a big, big, big deal. And so in this moment, I'm sure like everybody's going, oh, my goodness, a new one? Like, there's a new command that's coming. So everybody pulled out their notebooks. They all grabbed a pen, and they all leaned in ready to take some notes. And then Jesus says this. You ready? Here's what he says. Love one another. And, and nothing. Love one another another. And I bet they were like, 
That's not new. We've been knowing that. What do you mean love one another? Jesus is like, yeah, 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 I know you know that, but you've been doing it wrong. Like all this time, you've been doing it wrong. And then he clarifies. Look what he says next. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And with those five little words, Jesus sets the standard for how we should love the other people in our life. And this wasn't some kind of like, hey, small acts of kindness kind of deal. He wasn't saying from now on, I want you to hold the door open for people or give up your seat on the train. I want you to bring people a meal when they're sick. That's all good and well. But this was way deeper than that. This was a much bigger thing than that. This was as I have loved you. That This was a man who humbled himself and left heaven to come to earth. This was a man who looked into a world that was broken and busted, and he didn't turn away. This was a man who, who would choose to put our need for a savior ahead of his own comfort. And this is a man who, who, when we didn't deserve it, and we couldn't have earned it, he loved us, forgave us, accepted us. His love was unconditional, unending, and it didn't discriminate. And so Jesus kind of reaches in here and says, yeah, I know, I know you think you know this already. But you've been doing it wrong. Listen, if you want to follow me, then I want you to begin loving other people as I have loved you. And 2,000 years have passed since Jesus said those words. And history tells the tale of how the church and followers of Jesus have been at their best when they remembered what he said. And how the church and followers of Jesus have been at their worst when they've forgotten. See, this is why some of you don't do church. You just met too many Christians, right? Like, they talk a good game. They get all dressed up on Sunday. But then you watch them Monday through Friday, and somehow it doesn't bother them how they treat other people. And then they want you to come to their church and you're thinking, no, thank you. <laughs> like, I'm not going to do that. Like, I see the way that you treat other people and I don't think whatever it is that you do on Sundays is making much of a difference in your life. I would not want to be part of that. I'm just saying. But what Jesus taught is different. What Jesus taught changed the game, because what Jesus taught doesn't leave room for us not to love the other people around us. And so let me needle just for a moment. That means that if you're a Democrat, then that means loving the people to the right of you. And if you're a Republican, that includes loving the people to the left of you. And if for some ridiculous reason you have a bias against someone who's different than you, that means loving those people that you wouldn't want to have anything to do with. You see, loving your neighbor includes people that are nothing like you. And it goes as far as to include people who you might not like and who honestly might not like you. In fact, it was Jesus that said, love your enemies and pray for them. Pray for them. We don't even pray for our friends. He said, he said, love your enemies and pray for them. Are you kidding me? You see, this, what Jesus taught, this was an uncommon kind of love. It was the hallmark, the calling card, the signature of the life of Jesus. It's the thing that set him apart from everyone else. It's the way that he loves you. It's how he loves all the people that are nothing like you. And if you're a follower of Jesus... It's how he wants you to learn to love the other people around you. You see, here's what I know. God wants your life to be a reflection of what he's like. Like more than anything else, God wants your life to be a reflection of what he's like. Like all throughout the New Testament, you and I, we're invited to love people in an uncommon way. The way that God's loved us. And that is what this is all about. 
It's about experiencing God's love for ourselves and then turning around and giving that same kind of love to other people. That's why Jesus goes on to say in this passage we're looking at in John 13, verse 35, he says this, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have perfect attendance at church. If you act real religious and know a bunch of Bible stuff. If you know all the words to all the songs that they sing, you can sing them with your eyes closed and your hand up. And it... <laughs> no. If you love one another. You know what's spiritual? Loving one another. Not <laughs> loving one another. Jesus is saying there's a connection between your vertical relationship with God and your horizontal relationships with other people. He says, hey, if you're connected this way, then you're going to love people this way. He says, in fact, you can't have this if you don't have this. I think it's important to note that, that, that the word love here isn't just a feeling, right? Like remember that old song? When I fall in love, it will be forever, or I'll never fall in love, right? Remember that old song? The love here in this passage, it isn't like the song. It's not something you fall in and out of. No, love is a verb. It's an action. It's something you choose to do whether you feel like it or not. And so loving one another isn't about whether you have warm, fuzzy feelings in the moment. Loving one another is choosing to act in a way that shows your love for other people whether you feel like it or not. Now this, this is great marriage advice. It's great relational advice, I'm telling you. This right here is huge, right? In fact, let me put it this way. The key to a great marriage is to make love a verb. <laughs> I know, but now you'll remember, right? <laughs> like you're going to remember. You're going to know for the rest of your life. You're going to be like, oh, hey, baby, the key to a great marriage is to make love. Actually, you're kind of creepy if you do that. You shouldn't do that. I just, the pastor said, you probably should do that too. I'm just saying, can't hurt, all right? Fellas, got your back. Bottom line, love is an action. It's a verb, it's not just a feeling. It's something that you choose to do. Now, Ephesians chapter 4 is really interesting because the apostle Paul who ran around spreading this message of Jesus, this, this thing that set Jesus apart from everyone else. He talks about this connection between the vertical and the horizontal. And I just want to read you these last two verses as we start to land the plane. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, it says this. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life that's worthy of the calling you've received. Now, it's interesting because that word calling here means invitation. He says, hey, you've been invited into a relationship with God, a relationship that's characterized with unconditional love and unconditional forgiveness and unconditional acceptance and unconditional inclusion. And so now because of that, I want you to live your life in a manner that's worthy of that kind of an invitation. Now, if you've ever received an invitation, you know that, that with every invitation, there are absolutely some expectations, right? If you ever received an invitation to a wedding, then there's some expectations that you're not going to show up in your sweatpants. I'm just saying, you probably shouldn't do that. There's expectations that go along with every invitation. If you get invited to the White House, you're at least going to wear your good flip-flops. <laughs> right? It's going to happen. Just saying. It's important, okay? With every invitation, there's some expectations. So Paul says, you've been invited to be in a relationship with God where he forgives your sin, where your eternity is secure." where you're unconditionally loved, unconditionally accepted, where you're included in every way, which you didn't deserve any of. And so because of that, I want you to strive with everything you've got in you to live a life that's worthy of that invitation. 
And then Paul goes on to explain what that would look like. And this is where you would expect him to say something like, and so don't miss church too much. And so make sure you start praying harder. And so make sure you do a bunch of religious stuff, you know. But instead, look what Paul says in verse 2. He says, here's what it looks like to live a life that's worthy of the invitation of a relationship with God. He says, be completely humble and gentle, which here means self-controlled. Be patient and bearing with one another in love. Now, I don't know about you, but I read that and I'm like, wait, 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 wait. That's like a bunch of people stuff. Like that's not like a bunch of God vertical relationship stuff. That's like a bunch of horizontal people stuff. That's stuff I do with like, my family or my coworkers or my friends or the people around me like, or the people I come into contact with. Like, that's not a bunch of religious stuff. That's, that's people stuff. And Paul says, hey, you want to live a life that's worthy of the invitation that you've been given? Then here's how you do that. Be completely humble with other people. Be willing to put other people's things in front of your thing. Be gentle. Be self-controlled. Don't fly off the handle. When you're in a position of power, don't flip out because you're in that position of power. Don't leverage it in a bad way. He says be patient with other people. He says, I want you to make sure you bear with one another in love. And basically, he says, hey, those people that are hard to bear with, I want you to hang in there. Right? That's what it means to live a life worthy of the invitation you've been given. I don't know, but you're thinking, well, what's that got to do with anything? I think God would say it has everything to do with everything. Because remember, God wants your life to be a reflection of what he's like. So if you want to live a life worthy of the invitation you've been given, then he says, I want you to treat other people, get this, the same way I treated you. I humbled myself for you. I'm self-controlled with you. I'm so patient with you. Right? Like how many times have I turned away? The number is the same as the sand on the shore. But every time, he's taken me back. And now I pray you do it once more. Right? And he bears with me in love. There's absolutely a connection between our vertical relationships and our horizontal relationships. It's funny, um, my wife Tiffany, we've been, we've been married for 15 years now. And... Uh, when we were dating, I remember one of the first dates we went on, we went to the movies together. And we were sitting there watching the movie, and I was, I was like, really nervous. And right in the middle of the movie, she just kind of puts her hand on the armrest as if to say, come hither. <laughs> and I thought, oh, snap. <laughs> right? So I, I'm sitting there, and I was like, oh, man, I'm going to do it. We're going to hold hands. This is it. It's going down. Like, right now. Here we go. Woo. Oh, man. I'm like 20 years old. So, um, so I'm sitting there, and I was like, okay, here's how I'm going to do this. I'm going to give myself a countdown, right? So I was like 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 10, 9, 8. <laughs> I just, took me a little bit to get going, but once I just went for it and so far, I went, I went boom, and we held hands, and we rubbed thumbs. You don't even know. A <laughs> girl could rub some thumbs. I'm just going to stop right there. We can't say anything else. But I was like, wow. Yeah. I remember thinking, you complete me. Not long after that was our wedding day. She came walking down the aisle in that cute little dress, flowers in her hair. And I thought, you complete me. Some time passed, and when I look at and see the kind of mother that she is, now listen, I don't know. If, you're, if you happen to be a dad, maybe you get this, or maybe I just have a weird thing. I don't know. But there's something about seeing the kind of mom that she is that just makes me go, girl, you complete me. <laughs> and still, every once in a while, 
and I see her sleeping. She's so peaceful. And I'm like, wow, you complete me. We've been married for 15 years now. I've learned more about love from Tiffany Jacobs than anyone in the whole wide world. But you know what I know? She doesn't complete me. It's Jesus Christ who completes me. And because of that, it makes me a better husband to be married to. It makes me a better friend to do life with. And it makes me a better father to raise our kids with. You know why that's true? It's because my vertical relationship informs my horizontal relationships. And it's true for all the other relationships that we have as well. Our vertical relationship with God should inform how we treat the other people in our life, right? We should love others because God loves those people. Because when we didn't deserve it, God loved us, whether they deserve anything or not. No, that's why we should love others because God loves it. God's placed value on every single person. Every person matters. I mean, think about this. Like, let's think about some thou shouts real quick. Do you know why you should tell the truth? You know why you should tell the truth? It's not because the Bible says so. It's true that the Bible does say so. You should tell the truth. You shouldn't lie. But that's not the reason why you should tell the truth. You should tell the truth because whenever you lie, it hurts the people you lie to. And God loves those people, right? The reason why followers of Jesus shouldn't lie is because God loves the people that we are tempted sometimes to lie to. You know why you should be generous? Here's another one. It's not because the Bible says so. It's not, it's not even because, oh, because if I give God one dollar, he's gonna give me ten. Woo! No. It's like, what is what is that? Are you kidding me? Right? No, we should be generous. We should give generously because when we do that, it helps people. Like that's the reason why. No, no, no. I give so I can get the blessing. Huh. <laughs> Listen, if, if you have running water and indoor plumbing, you're blessed. I'm just saying, compared to the rest of the world, you are the 1%. You're blessed. It's not about the blessing. We should be generous because it helps other people. Oh. Going deep this morning. How about this? You know why you should not talk badly about other people? Because loose lips sink ships. It's in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. It's from World War II. <laughs> the Bible does say you shouldn't gossip, but it's not because the Bible says so you shouldn't gossip. It's because when you gossip, it hurts other people. And, and, and come on, let's be honest. We're smart enough to know that gossip hurts other people. Like, you don't need a chapter and verse. Right. Come on, right, right. With, in most instances, you don't need a chapter and verse to know what the loving thing to do would be. You don't. You don't. It's like, where is that? What is that? No, no, just don't be a jerk. I'm just saying, right? That's, you know, hey, like, there's no verse that exactly says that, but Jesus kind of said that. Love other people. In fact, in every relational circumstance, Here's a pro tip. Here's the question that we need to ask ourselves. What does love require of me? What does love require of me? Should I forgive or not forgive? What does love require of me? Should I lie or tell the truth? What does love require of me? Should I give or not give? What does love require of me? Should I say something or just keep my mouth closed? What does love require of me? When you're right and they're wrong and you've got the perfect moment where you can power up and make them eat their words, what does love require of me? When you've got somewhere to be and she's taking her sweet time inside the house and you're in the car and you're like, mm, and you really want to, you know what you want to do, right? But you did that one time. You honked the horn and she came out and went, like, you took the time to come do that? <laughs> Man, just finish up what you're doing. Come on, we got to go. You honked one time. It took him longer. He's like, well, I just ain't even coming. You can just sit out in the car. 
<laughs> when you got somewhere to be, and you want to, what does love require of you? What's interesting about this question is that it makes it so simple, but it's so hard. It is, right? But like I said, this is an uncommon love. Listen, whenever God answered this question, when he looked into a broken, busted world and saw that it needed a savior, when he answered this question, it cost him his son. When Jesus answered this question, it cost him his life. And if you start answering this question, I'm telling you, it's going to cost you something too. But the good news is that God helps us with that. Listen, we say it all the time. Following Jesus doesn't just make your life better. It makes you better at life. It really does. I'm telling you, if you'll take this, if you'll ask this question, what does love require of me? Your relationships would be better. Your world would be better. You will be better. Can you imagine what would happen if our families did that? If we asked that question before we reacted? Come on. Imagine, imagine if we taught our kids to do that. Can you imagine how different your, your romantic relationships would be if you did that, right? Like you look at the dishwasher and you know that stuff's got to be put away and you're like, oh, what is love? require of me. Just act like you didn't see it. Move on. <laughs> Can you imagine how different your work might be if people you work with ask that question? If you begin to ask that question, what does love require of me? Right? Is it about cutting other people off at the past so I can get ahead in spite of them? What does love require of me? How might that change your culture? Can you imagine what would happen in our city if thousands of people from Epic Church stopped walking around with their eyes closed to the needs around us, but actually started to ask the question, what does love require of me? 2,000 years ago, there was a movement built around this question, and it changed the whole world. It happened in the first century. I believe it can happen again. But we've got to be willing to ask the question, what does love require of me? Yeah? Challenged? Encouraged? <laughs>